I have to say I love that last talk, and I, um, Hortense Spilliers is in the department with me at Vanderbilt, and I think she would have been thrilled to hear it. Um, when I was a girl in Motown in the early 60s, my father would wake me up in the middle of the night and drive from our house in the center of Detroit out to a factory called River Rouge to see the midnight shift change. We would sit in his Ford car and my daddy would always say the same thing, a city coming out, a city going in. At its height, 100,000 people worked at River Rouge and it took 3,500 new mop heads, 3,500 new mops a month to keep the factory clean. River Rouge was my daddy's ocean. We lived off it. He provided services to the workers. It was Ziggy Johnson's ocean, too. Let me give you a taste of that. This is an excerpt from my novel in progress, Zagging with Ziggy, which in some sense you're all going to be in. There are two components to the novel, a fictional biography of dancer Ziggy Johnson, written by one of his former students, Mary Alice, interspliced with Mary Alice's fictional memoir of growing up under the influence of Ziggy. In my novel, just prior to the publication of The Black Zipville, Mary Alice is invited to Ann Arbor, Michigan to give a talk, Ziggy and the Urban. The fictional Ziggy is closely based on a real person, the real Ziggy Johnson, published over 800 newspaper columns. And that's how you, I began with to construct his voice from Zagging with Ziggy. Imagining the city and being imagined in the city has been a powerful and often contradictory experience for black lives in 20th and 21st century America. For some African Americans, imagining the city was a primary act of, prepar of preparation for taking part in the Great Migration. For others, it was a conscious act of self-liberation while remaining planted in the rural South. For Merst, imagining the city was a positive expansion. Being imagined in the city was something quite different. In 20th century film and later television, portrayals of African Americans, beginning with urban portrayals in Birth of a Nation, frequently reflected African Americans being viciously imagined in the city, often as violent male urban youths and sexually depraved, exploited and exploiting female urban youths. These imaginings have done much to contain and constrain black identity. In black parlance, the word urban has become polluted. By the time the 20th century gave way to the 21st, in many black communities, urban renewal was considered a code phrase for Negro removal. And the phrase urban youth was a suspect as a code phrase for damaged goods of African origin, less than human. Even as the term urban contemporary came to mean black music popular with white audiences. As a novelist who identifies as African American, I have imagined and reimagined how my characters imagine the urban, reimagine the urban, are damaged by the urban, and are sustained by the urban. And then on the way to writing a novel, I found a subject that invited biography. The Black Zigfield, or Black Kamala, explores Ziggy Johnson's journey to becoming urban, a journey that centers on three Motown locations, the show bars where he MC, the Gotham Hotel where he lived, and the Ziggy Johnson School of Theater where he taught a next generation to dance and to become his very favorite flavor of citified. Ziggy kept a journal. Let me give you a taste of it. There is a world that explains Detroit to me. Breadwinner. That's the first thing I saw when I came here, what Detroit had more than Chicago or St. Louis or New York City or Los Angeles. Black men who would go out and earn a wage, a good wage, a steady wage, doing a skilled job. The factory people. Some people sneer when they say factory people. I smile. Car factory people made Detroit. Detroit. They were doctors, nurses, lawyers, ministers, black doctors, nurses, lawyers, ministers, school teachers, and all manner of business folk, from number kingpins and Mac men to dry cleaners and automobile salesmen, and telephone companies, switchboard operators to barbers, beauticians, morticians, politicians, and show folks. But we all cater to the car factory folk, the car factory folk, and the car, the tire factory folk, the breadwinners. They drove it. We all knew that and gave them their respect. 
those men who did that shift work. I remember when River Rouge moved 24-7, three shifts a day. That was opportunity. This is what the Opes never see. When a man, a sepia man, a father, is driving down the street in a Cadillac or a Mustang, wherever he's driving, he knows a black man. If it's a Detroit, some black man he knew helped make it. You get in a long stretch of flat and straight, and you put the pedal down, and that car glides. It doesn't shake. You're a speed merchant, and you're not driving just yourself. You're driving some other black man's sweat and prosperity. You send in some other proud papa's kid to music lesson, to a black private school, school, to a black camp, to a summer week in Idlewild, to my dancing school, to starring in the youth colossal Father's Day at the Latin Quarter. There were no white faces in the Latin Quarter, none. There were our children on the stage, and everybody looking up to the footlights spotted someone in the tap line and thought, he could be the second coming of Christ. Saw so one of the girls that thought she could be the next Virgin Mary, and Lord, don't all the apostles look good. Breadwinners and their babies. I made a place where 500 black children were each our brother's witness, our sister's witness. What an education our boys and girls got. They learned they were beautiful. They learned we speak Spanish and French and we travel the world. And that is why the big performers love to come to the show. Everywhere else, they played for white folk, but at the Latin Quarter on Father's Day, they played for the little boy and the little girl they once were, and they played for the breadwinner. They say 8,000 black men were working in the factories by the end of World War I, almost 2004. The work wasn't easy or pretty. Many of the first of the black fac Ford factory folk were janitors and cleaners. They worked in the belly of the beast, and the beast was a giant glass furnace in the center of the city. But they worked rain or shine, worked like you can't work on a farm, rain or shine. And they knew how much money the fee and the check when it came. And it may not have been what the white fellow got, hell it wasn't, but it was the same every time, and you could plan with that. Five dollars a day, buy a house with that, get to Idlewild with that, have a night out at the club where some singer, some dancer, some barmaid could make you forget all you knew about the belly of the beast after you crawled out of it. And you could plan how it was your son and your daughter would never crawl back in. On a farm, it looks like your children's children's children will be planting acres and fighting rain and weevils and every kind of plague. In a factory, you worry about losing a hand or getting killed right off, but you know your child may not have to go into the factory if you do it right and long enough. You know there's a college down the road and your child might get to it. What I wanted work to do in Detroit give the breadwinners a treat. Joseph Ziggy Johnson was born in Chicago in 1913. He made his name as a dancer and choreographer in Bronzeville, black urban Chicago, including um, choreographing drag shows there before leaving to move to Detroit to the world of Black Bottom. He preferred the way the urban was enacted on the banks of the Detroit River to the way it was performed on the shores of Lake Michigan. A featured columnist for over a decade for three of the most significant black urban newspapers of his day, the Chicago Defender, the Michigan Chronicle, and the Pittsburgh Courier. He published over a thousand articles and he's been almost completely unrecognized. Johnson's columns ostensibly focused on show folk, show biz, and show reviews, but defining the essence of the urban and parsing distinctions between various urban black imaginaries was central to his life's project. His first Zagging with Ziggy column was published in 1952. His last column was published days after his death in 1967. I was born in Detroit, Michigan in 59. As a girl, I attended Ziggy Johnson School of Theater and performed in the Youth Colossal as a ballet babe. The black Zidfo chronicles Ziggy's hard bid to become urban. Becoming urban is not easy. In part, Ziggy would argue, that's because others, black and white, won't let you become urban. Here's a snippet from a 1966 column. Ziggy, where are you going for Christmas? I'm going home to see my mother and grandson. You mean you're going to Chicago to see your mother and grandson? Your home is in Natchez. Natchez, Mississippi. Ziggy's mother's hometown is not an urban space. In black English, the plural of y'all is all y'all, and the opposite of urban is not rural, it is country. Natchez is country. In the country, identities, particularly black identities, are largely predetermined. 
and the elemental black perspective is what W.E.B. Du Bois identified as double consciousness, and it is predetermined as well. I think we do well to look a little at the soul of black folk. The Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness. The sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, and measuring one's soul by the tape of the world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. Whatever feels is two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strikers, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Urban as becoming. To become urban for Ziggy Johnson is to become bifurcated in new, exciting, and eclipsing ways. A division between the private and public, not black and white, becomes for Ziggy paramount. This urban becoming has everything to do with drawing energy, inspiration, and power from private spaces particular to the urban and public spaces made possible by the urban. It involves harnessing anonymity and riding it to self-invention. For Ziggy, the urban provides a particular catalytic trinity, space where you compose yourself, self that is not accessible to others, a space for intimate relations away from the scrutiny of outsiders, and finally, space where you are on display to be proudly and profoundly scrutinized and appreciated by empathetic and self-like eyes. For Ziggy, this becoming urban required the particular isolation and privacy of the Gotham Hotel, required the sage black audiences of the Detroit show bars, required the protégés he found and created when he opened up the Ziggy Johnson School of Theater. Ziggy spends gallons of ink writing about the Gotham Hotel of his columns. 111 Orchestra's place was his address, and it was his claiming anchor to being the citizen of a global black cosmopolitan, of being a citizen of a planet flavor of urbanite, though he didn't have a passport. The Gotham was a nine-story high-rise building situated at the quarter of John R., referred to as the much-storied street and orchestra place in downtown Detroit. Built in 1924 at the White Hotel, the building was raised in 1963. Beginning in 1943, the majority stakeholder in the hotel was the African-American world traveler, Walter White, and the hotel began to cater specifically to African-American guests pulled to Detroit by the lures of the great big city. When the Gotham opened as a black hotel, it was one of the few black hotels in America where every room had its own private bath and toilet. Ziggy was one of the many who deemed the Gotham the finest hotel of America, owned and managed by black people for black people. Ziggy defined himself by his residence in the Gotham Hotel. I am a hotel man, he wrote and often repeated. When he also wrote, everybody's got a home but me, it was more a boast than a complaint and it was a significant convenience. In addition to the desk clerks, maids, restaurants that liberated Ziggy from domestic chores and the necessity of acquiring a wife to perform them, the Gotham also offered an ever-changing parade of personalities from what Ziggy called big wigs to what he called small fry. Count Basie, Jack Robinson, Ella Fitzgerald, Thurgood Marshall, all checked into the Gotham, but so did Clara Ward gospel singers in 1953, and 30 students from Xenia, Ohio in 1956 all of whom made it into his column. Strangers coming and going is an essence of Ziggy's urban. The lobby was always buzzing. The elevators were often full. So many reasons to come into the place, from visiting a friend to placing a bet. The numbers racket thrived in the shelter of the hotel, to attending a lunch or a meeting, or visiting a preacher or a school group or a politician. Everybody had multiple reasons to be at the Gotham, even if it was just to ogle the art, whether it was the yearly exhibit of the Shutterbug Club of Photographs or the collection of oil paint portraits painted by Artist Lane, the black city leaders. Judge Ward, McCree, John Roxborough, Charles Diggs, or Ralph Bunch, or the man Ziggy called Immaculate Irving Rome. This was an aspect of the urban that Ziggy particularly treasured, with all the coming and going in the lobby of the Gotham Hotel. No one knew who was coming for or with Ziggy. 
When Ziggy left the Gotham, he was most likely headed to the show bar. The 20 Grand, the 606 Lounge, Act 4, Anne's Bar, Avito's Bar, Rufus Harvey's FX Bar, Baker's Keyboard Lounge, Chick's Jordan Fishman's Chit Chat Lounge, Club El Sino, Duval Fall, The Drove, Elbow Lounge, Exchange, Hague Show Bar, Hobby Bar, Flame, Fomax, Wallet Bar, Garfo Lounge, Jeans Bar, The Grand Bar, Little Mary's Bar, Parrot Show Lounge, The Peter Pan Lounge, Phelps Lounge, Playboy Lounge, Pontchartrain, Prosperity Bar, Purple Onion, Randora's Hotel, River Rouge Lounge, Rooster Tail, Seven Bar, Starlight Lounge, Sugar Hill Bar, Walla Room, Warren's Crib, Ziglet Zag Lounge. These are just the ones that appear most often in his columns. They're all, it was probably the largest concentration of live music ever assembled in America. Somebody should be working on that. And these were the places, these were Ziggy's favorite places to perform on and off stage. Concentration of artists was an essence of Ziggy's urban, but more than the artists, it was the appreciating and discerning black audience that was an essential essence of Ziggy's urban. An audience that year after year became more knowledgeable because they were exposed year after year to so much of what he liked to call high caliber singing, dancing, and playing. An audience that didn't save up to go to the Apollo once a month or once a year, but had ringside reservations at favorite clubs multiple nights of the week. People did not come to these bars in work clothes that they might come to the Jukes and Ziggy's mother's home state of Mississippi. The importance to the Detroiter of being sh as sharp, as sleek, as well designed as the cars they built and sometimes drove was not lost on Ziggy. He wrote about it all the time. In column after column, he describes the audiences in detail. Men and women who came on display after periods of privacy in which they composed their look and their attitude. The men came in $100 sports jackets, and women came wearing silk and dragging furs. They came seeing and being, reading and being read by a diverse group of like selves into spaces of respite and respect. The importance of clothes, citified clothes, Chesterfield coats, Windsor knotted ties, and citified evolutions, including for the men the right hair promenade, Dr. A.W. or Curtis's checks, that keeps hair from reverting from perspiration, and bath oils and sinnet soaps for men as well as women was powerfully and repeatedly appreciated and documented in the columns by Ziggy. In Detroit, clothes were urban instruments of social mobility rather than markers of social place as they had been in his mother's Mississippi. Wearing factory-made store-bought impractical clothes and assembling them to be powerful modes of self-expression and swagger was his act of becoming urban for Ziggy. In the city, sharp appearance created new possibilities because people in the city, and of course these are the Supremes in front of the De um, Brewster Projects and also in some other areas of Detroit. Um, in the city, sharp appearance created new possibilities because people in the city are not always known to each other. They are less easily placed, less easily recognized and relegated to preset status. In Ziggy cities, Detroit, Chicago, Miami, clothes, evolutions, hobbies, and sports, particularly golf, horseback riding, boating, which created opportunities for wearing extravagant ensembles, created and conveyed elevated rank and enhanced status. Sharpness became an urban manifestation of intelligence, discipline, innovation, and the desire to give and receive visual pleasure by self-construction, not natural beauty. Give and receive visual pleasure by self-construction, not natural beauty. This flavor of dandyism was an essential essence of Ziggy Zerbin. It was an essence rooted in Chicago, a place of rich intersections, a place where tomorrow became more important to de than today, a place where Ziggy first claimed dancer as an occupation on the federal census. Eventually, Ziggy became dissatisfied with the Whitney City. For the most part, he spent a lot of time performing with black entertainers in front of white audiences. That's what was largely going on uh, for him there. He became dissatisfied, and he looked for a place where black lives in the present were tightly tied to the past, and over, were not so tightly tied to the past, and overshadowed by a white presence. Ziggy didn't want something better than the poor rural South. That's what he saw the vision of Chicago as, something better than the poor rural South. He wanted something better than Bronzeville, better than black Chicago. That is a far more audacious wish. Ziggy imagined a better city, then set off to find it. St. Louis was an early stop. 
Besides Detroit, Chicago, the cities that he wrote about most often, his columns were St. Louis, New York, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and Miami. Miami, imagined and visited, was particularly important to Ziggy. Miami was a location of sunshine and leisure contrasted to the sunshine and work of the rural South. He found this delightfully urban. New York was a place he visited with regularity but with little pleasure. He did not view New York as a land of opportunity. He viewed New York as a territory with the emergence of television of new inequities. He kept tabs on what black show folks were doing on Ed Sullivan, not enough, on Broadway, not enough, at the Apollo, too little money, but he always repeated in his column, he found the city very, very cold. And this was the man who knew the Michigan snow and the wind off Lake Michigan. In Motown, Ziggy moved from searching for a better black city to helping create a better city. In 1952, Ziggy Johnson opened the Ziggy Johnson School of Theater. In June of that year, on Father's Day, he mounted the first of his grand youth-centered musicals that became a centerpiece of the Detroit year. To understand the prominence of these events, let me drop a few of the names Ziggy dropped in this column into his show. These are people who danced with his child dancers on stage. Sammy Davis, The Temptations, The Four Tops, The Supremes, helping backstage getting students into costume, Gladys Knight, knocking back drinks at the bar, learning how to dance and mourning his own father. Always hard day for him, Father's Day, always there at Ziggy's show, Marvin Gaye. The man loved Motown, the institution he founded in Motown, the Ziggy Johnson School of Dance, and the day he owned in Motown, Father's Day. Ziggy understood the rural South to be a place where African Americans had to be useful and often found themselves ugly. So the breadwinners were useful in Mr. Ford's factory. This very usefulness marked them in Ziggy's mind, though they were living in Detroit as country. The children in his dance school were not learning to be useful. They were learning to be beautiful, to become significant in their selves, not in how they might serve others. Ziggy taught dance, yes. He won dance competitions, yes. That middle picture is the girl who wins a dance competition in the city from Ziggy's show. But ambition, discipline, community organization, and that complex preparation for urban life that is showmanship were all central to the curriculum. He was teaching fearless self-display. Ziggy wasn't about teaching dance. He was about teaching how to be citified and win. Ziggy became Ziggy, moving between the Gotham Hotel, the show bars, and his dancing school. Ziggy came to recognize, claim, the measure set himself against his own interior ideals. Or to put it as he might have put it, I pulled myself together and I accepted every piece. This integration of everything Ziggy into a self-coherent individual could possibly have happened in other locales. It did happen in the onlyness of a rented hotel room single. In the bath, water laced with fragrant oil, bathing himself with scented soap, Ziggy became Ziggy, a person willing to write in the newspaper about his bath, a self-defined and self-created person, an urbanite. The Gotham show bars, the dance school, each of these were settings where Dick, Ziggy could have measured himself against the ideals of discerning black audiences in ways that made white audiences respond unimportant while sharpening his self-perception on the whetstone of the wide variety of humans with whom he interacted. A volatile combination of privacy and display made possible by the city. This was the essence of Ziggy's urban. In Motown, he found a particularly fertile ground, space where it was possible to engage the density of personalities and density of possibilities rising from sheer vast numbers of people that coexisted with space to be alone and become. Ziggy made powerful use of the alienation possible in the city. Ziggy did more than give the breadwinners a treat. He taught their children to how to be citizens of the black, global, cosmopolitan, denizens of the urban, by teaching them, teaching them to be like him, separate and connected. He taught that life was performance art. He taught swagger. He taught that a lot. When James Nixon, desk clerk at the Gotham Hotel, dressed in his favorite remix of prep, some clothes from Harvard Yale Princeton he never went to, his own flavor of sharp that Ziggy described as an ivy look, handed Ziggy 
When that man had his Ziggy postcards, Ziggy's friends had posted, and really had posted, from Japan, from China, from Paris, from Russia, postcards from black people abroad. This was a multi-layered performance. What was written on the cards? What happened? Or what they wanted to have happened? What was told? What impression one wished to make? All performance. Handing the card with a smile, pretending not to have read it. Performance. With each performance, as both men smiled and the postcards became prompt, Nixon joined with Ziggy in creating a true city center where it was possible to invent and reinvent yourself and self-invention was celebrated as truth, not lie. Ziggy taught the children the breadwinners how to measure themselves against the best, each other, or their own damn self. Life as performance art was for Ziggy an urban occupation and a central truth of urban black life. Self-making was not a possibility for him in southern rural environments. It was a fruit of a tree that grew best for Ziggy in Detroit. <laughs>